Hi there, welcome to UCM at UBC. UCM stands for University Christian Ministry and UBC stands for University of British Columbia, located out here in Western BC in Vancouver itself. Um, if you found us today and you're new to UCM, I encourage you to check out the uh, links in the description box and find out a little bit more about what we do here on campus. If you're a regular attender, um, thank you for staying tuned with what we've been up to. Um, I'd encourage you to get hooked up with Ian and the, the communications team with um, newsletters. That way you can stay up to date on what we're doing, what events we're running, just because there won't be any announcements in this video, because probably by the time you watch this, they're all well and done and gone and in the past. So there'll be some worship, there'll be some prayer, there'll probably be some teaching. Um, can't say for certain as this is all pre-recorded, but I hope that you enjoy what we have for you and put on YouTube um, and you uh, like and subscribe and stay tuned for next time. Could we recount the ways that you have multiplied our faith? The wisdom of your ways, the currents of your grace expressed in every moment, every way. In the longing of our souls In the darkness where we go You are there, you are love You are all together good In the weakness of our faith In the silence where we wait You are here, you're enough You are all together good Through our joys and in our griefs You have led us to believe The wisdom of your ways And the currents of your grace expressed Our only hope for all our days in the longing of our souls In the darkness where we go You are there, you are love You are all together good In the weakness of our faith In the silence where we wait You are there, you are enough You are all together good I love you, Lord I love you, Lord You are my more Holy, present, and pure I Of our souls in the darkness where we go, you are there, you are love, you are all together good in the silence of our faith, in the darkness where we wait, you are there, 
You were alive, you were all together good In the longing of our souls In the darkness where we go You are there, you are love You were all together good In the weakness of our faith In the silence where we wait you are here, you're enough, you are all together good. God is my shepherd, I won't be wanting, I won't be wanting. He makes me rest in fields of green by quiet Even though I walk through the valley, death and dying, I will not fear, you are with me, you are with me. Shepherd staff comforts me. You are my feast in the presence of enemies. Surely goodness will follow me. Will follow me in the house of God forever. God is my shepherd, I won't be wanting, I won't be wanting. He makes me rest, fields of green, a quiet street. While I'm walking through the valley, death and dying, and I will not fear, you are with me, and you are with me. Shepherd staff comforts me. You are my feet in the presence of enemies. Surely goodness will follow me. Will follow me in the house of God forever. House of God forever, the house of God forever, the house of God forever, the house of God forever. House of God forever. So God forever. The 
Set her fighting down in my soul That I can't contain, that I can't control I want more of you, God And I want more of you, God Set her fire down in my soul That I can't contain, that I can't control I want more of you, God I want more of you, God No place I'd rather be No place I'd rather be No place I'd rather be Here in your love, here in your love No place I'd rather be No place I'd rather be No place I'd rather be Here in your love here in your love Set a fire down in my soul That I can't contain, that I can't control I want more of you, God I want more of you, God Set a fire down in my soul That I can't contain, that I can't control I want more of you, God I want more of you, God No place I'd rather be No place I'd rather be No place I'd rather be Than here in your love, here in your love No place I'd rather be No place I'd rather be No place I'd rather be of God forever House of God forever In the house of God forever Um, so Mark is the Associate Professor of Pastoral Theology at Regent College um, here in Vancouver. And um, I actually met Mark about a year ago. Um, he was giving a talk on um, how God loves the foreigner and the outsider. And yeah, and I just was very impacted by that talk. Um, and then I think soon after that, he accepted um, his role as the Associate Professor of Pastoral Theology at Regent. And so we're very excited to have him here. Um, yeah, and so I'll just pass it on to you, Mark. Thank you. How's the sound? Does this sound okay? Great. Uh, I can't quite share my screen right now, Diane. Is there a way to do that? Sure. I'm going to see if someone is... Okay, perfect. There we go. I think you're a co-host now. Ah, uh, great. Perfect. Thank you. Can you guys kind of see that? Great. I'll just kind of muck around with my screen here so I can also see you. And that's that's happening. Well, it's so good to be part of this. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you for that beautiful time of worship. I'm so grateful to be with you. And I look forward to the years of getting to know at least some of you really well. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, I missed the introduction because I had one of those Zoom moments where the sound was coming through my microphone. And I thought, Some, Diane's mouth's moving, but I ain't hearing anything. So anyway, whatever Diane said, hopefully is right, and hopefully it was kind. <laughs> but it's really good to see you guys, and yeah, it's going to be fun to get to know you better. I'm kind of new to UBC. I live out in East Van in Commercial Drive, and now I'm teaching at Regent College. Yeah, you're out there, Nick. You're out in East Van as well, or used to be. Yeah, it's good coffee. Yeah, used to be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a bit of culture out here. I'm a jazz musician, so I get to play a bit. Maybe Diane said that. I have no idea. <laughs> so, hey, it's so good to see you. Um, so I, I just thought the Ten Commandments could be a fun place to go uh, and a significant place to go, partly because it's a text from Scripture that's been cherished 
for every generation of the church, really for the last 2,000 years and beyond, back beyond Jesus in Judaism. So somehow it's sort of, if as a central canonical text, the Ten Commandments would be there, if you can kind of use that phrase. Um, but what's fascinating to me about the Ten Commandments is it's probably this generation, like my generation, where the Ten Commandments has sort of faded from Christian liturgy, right? I mean, if you know anything about Christianity, you will have heard of the this phrase, the Ten Commandments, maybe seen a Moses movie sort of thing and the two stone tablets there. But in the church in this generation, they're not spoken about so much. And that's just interesting, you know. And I think as an Old Testament scholar, actually that the Ten Commandments are very radical and just, just deeply carved in the warp and woof of the creation. And I think that they can really energize not just the church, but even society to pay attention to some of the pressing cultural issues today. That's my opinion. Let's see if you agree in the next 20 minutes, half an hour. And if you don't agree, you can push back in the question time. That's fine by me. You know, Martin Luther said 500 years ago, a German Christian leader, I recite the Ten Commandments daily, word for word, like a child. And John Calvin, another significant Christian leader 500 years ago, in sort of Martin Luther's generation, he took the Ten Commandments to be a summary of kind of the ethical spirit of the scripture or what he called the moral law. But today, it's interesting. It's not, it doesn't play a significant role. I wonder if it's because we interpret the Ten Commandments sort of individualistically, right? Thou shalt not murder. We think to ourselves, well, I haven't murdered. Thou shalt not steal. We think to ourselves, well, apart from maybe stealing a cookie or two in my childhood, I haven't stolen that much and commit adultery. Well, you know, knock on wood, you know. So, so we, we kind of, we, we interpret them individualistically. And so they seem a bit irrelevant to the things that say millennial generation really care about and what seems to be very, very significant in culture today. So I want to offer the Ten Commandments are richer than that. So to understand the Ten Commandments properly, you've got to understand this. They were given at Mount Sinai in the Old Testament story. It's there recorded in Exodus 20 and in Deuteronomy 5, those two texts, Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. You've got to understand in the narrative, the, the Ten Commandments are given at Mount Sinai by God to the people of Israel, people of ancient Israel, only two and a half months out of emancipation from slavery. Now think of that context. In other words, this is an enslaved nation, and the, the wounds from the ancient Egyptian whip on their backs still would have been raw and weeping. I mean, post-traumatic stress disorder from the experience of slavery would have hardly set in, right? Now, just let's just think in our mind, if you know the story, go over in your mind what that experience was like. The opening chapters of the book of Exodus tells it. And if you don't know the story, well, this is what happened. The nation of Israel was an enslaved nation, the hands of the ancient Egyptian empire. And in order to keep this kind of enslaved population kind of uh, subjugated, Israel was uh, oppressed. And four foremen were beaten, sometimes even to death, we learn. There was a regime where male babies were systematically killed at birth in order to keep this labor force uh, under control. It's all there in the book of Exodus chapter 1. Genocide. And here they are, two and a half months later, after this great act of slave emancipation. You might remember the story that Moses was chosen by God to be a leader. He was a Hebrew, an ancient Israelite, and he grew up in Pharaoh's court. You may remember the story. And God appears to Moses at a burning bush. And the Lord said to Moses, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. And I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings and I have come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me and I've also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. God knows, God sees, God hears the cry of the oppressed. And in a great act of literally slave emancipation, God emancipates these slave people and now brings them to Sinai to receive laws. And you're going to see now that with these laws, 
God is shaping this ancient people to be a community that's in complete contradistinction to the oppression of Egypt. God's shaping a community with these laws, what's called the Torah in the Old Testament or Jewish tradition, that's in complete contradistinction to this regime of slavery and accumulation and aggrandizement of which Pharaoh was king. So here are two key questions for you to consider, and I'll come back to them at the end. What is the difference between the way in which the Ten Commandments may be understood in your church, if you're a churchgoer, and their original intention? And then B, it's an interesting thought, since you guys are all kind of studying, how can we train our people or nourish one another to pursue the vision of this law in their vocations? Let's just say, for example, you're studying science or studying physiotherapy. How might we train one another, nourish one another to pursue the vision of this law in their vocation? Okay, well, let me, what I want to do, I think, is I'm just going to focus on the more socially oriented laws. The first five commandments are more or less, more or less, especially the first four anyway, focused on the relationship between God and humankind. And from five to ten, they're focused on the social dimension. And I, I think I will lean into the social dimension for now, just for the sake of time, so that Diane doesn't kind of uh, block me or something, unfriend me. So we've given the background. Let's go to the fourth commandment, a Sabbath rest, and think about this. If a person is to thrive, if a person is to thrive, then life has to consist of more than just work. We need rest. And in ancient Egypt, no one had a rest. No one had a Sabbath, especially the Israelites. The brick factories of Pharaoh did not stop for weekends. And with that fourth commandment, the Lord says, six days you will work and the seventh day you will rest. You and your male and female slave and even your livestock. A weekly day of rest for this enslaved nation. What a remarkable initiative. A weekly day of rest proclaimed for a nation of slaves. What a relief. If a person is to thrive, life has got to be consist more of work, more of more than work. We need space for wear rest, for play, for recuperation. And from today in Israel, in ancient Israel, no one, especially the most vulnerable, Male and female servants, even the animals, are to be de deprived, including the stranger, the refugee, are to be deprived of this rhythm of work and rest, work and rest, work and rest. Can you see that the Sabbath command injects a life-giving pause into the endless cycle of production? Israel was an economy of production at any cost. Lives are expendable, especially Israelite lives, in the economic system of Pharaoh. And the Sabbath command says that the world can't operate like that. It's interesting just to pause right now and just take a step aside from the Old Testament story and to think of today. Our economy, by and large, is what we'd call a post-care economy. Our economy is a post-care economy. So what does the Sabbath mean for 20th century Bible readers? For 20th century human beings, it teaches us that we can't live in such a way that other people don't rest. Or even in such a way that the earth doesn't rest, because later in the book of Exodus, the Sabbath command is even applied to the creation itself. So the Sabbath command is about work. Our church here in East Van, it started a uh, social enterprise called Just Work. My friend Russell is the ED of Just Work, and Just Work offers employment for people who find it hard to keep a job or even to get a job. We have Just separated into three little businesses, Just Catering, Just Renos, and Just Potters. And we have a pottery studio in the basement of our church. And it's a double bottom line. One bottom line is to make a profit off jobs so that it can continue. The other bottom line is to provide employment, meaningful employment for those people who are employed by just work. I think the Sabbath rest has that idea of just work, of good work 
implied within that rhythm of work, rest, work, rest. It's about rest, but it's also rest implies good work. But I think that the way that the Old Testament applies a Sabbath command to the creation is very significant too. And I think that probably just about everyone on this call cares about global warming, which perhaps I think is probably the most pressing issue of our generation simply because of its sheer irreversibility. There's plenty of very important issues, but so many of them are more or less reversible. Not so with global warming. I'm an Aussie from Australia. There's Pacific Island nations that the, uh, <laughs> maybe Diane said that, I don't even know. You could have said I was, I'm from anywhere. Um, but, you know, it's significant to me as an Aussie that um, the Australian army is literally making logistical plans to evacuate certain low-lying Pacific islands with whom Australia has a relationship, such as Kiribati, spelt Kiribati. At the same time, Australian politicians tend to live in and to enact laws as if there's not global warming. So it's a political issue as well as a scientific one, as you know. But the, life, the Sabbath command says that God is not content with the way that human beings are living in this post-care economy. Let me keep moving on to the sixth command, say, thou shalt not murder. This is an interesting one. And you know that traditionally, I mean, if, you know, if you've been in the church for long, you would know that this command has been applied individualistically. You know, murder is a crime is the way probably that most of us would sort of think of that commandment if you're aware of that commandment. Murder is a crime. And perhaps it's been applied to society in terms of warfare, say, what could be a just war, or in terms of capital punishment, say, say, or maybe the issue of abortion. And these applications are important, though. They're complex. But the rest of the Old Testament makes it clear that thou shalt not, thou shalt not murder is spoken mostly to restrain the excesses of powerful people. Powerful people like Pharaoh. Again, to give the narrative context, They've just come out of Egypt, right? And if you were to check out passages such as the passage here I have from Deuteronomy 24.6, which just illustrates the value of human life over economic productivity, or go to Isaiah 58.59. The original context of these laws is slavery. Now just think about that. What beautiful words to give this nation of bereaved families, of ex-slaves, of oppressed brick workers, in Egypt, economic productivity was valued explicitly over human life. The foreman's life was threatened for the sake of brick coders. Male babies were killed to keep this labor force subjugated. And unlike Egypt, ancient Israel, God's people, were not to be a society of production at any cost, but of neighborly well-being. Now, this might sound obvious to us here in Canada, probably most of us are in Canada, maybe not all, given our COVID reality, but it's not obvious, you know. The reality is, I think, that in most cultures, economic productivity is valued implicitly and subtly and unstatedly over human life. I mean, to illustrate it historically, for example, you know, in England 100 years ago, 200 years ago, if you stole a sheep, no matter how hungry you were, if you stole a sheep, the, the, the consequence could be capital punishment or maybe transportation 200 years ago at any rate or 150 years ago. And that's valuing economic productivity over human life, of course. But, you know, if you look at global realities, I've just finished a book on global realities, which I'll share with you a bit later, if I may. The, the, there are perhaps 50 different lenses to show how actually Economic productivity is valued over human life. You think, for example, of international trade. I was reading the other day that Canada collected about half of our tariff revenue from developing countries. This makes their products more expensive to purchase. And those of you who are studying economics know this better than me. They're often higher, much higher than tariffs charged on imported goods that might be charged, say, on New Zealand or US or Australian goods, countries from whom we might benefit. And Quite literally, the poorest 49 countries globally make up 10% of the world's population, but account for only 0.4% of world trade. And the United Nations recently estimated that poor countries lose about $2 billion per day because of unjust trade rules. Many instituted, of course, instituted by, first world, by minority world countries, by 
Western countries. And this, the loss in unjust trade rules is literally 14 times the amount they receive in aid. And the sixth commandment, thou shalt not murder, teaches us that the world can't work like that. So you're getting, beginning to get, to get a feeling that put in their Old Testament context, put in their narrative context of this great slave emancipation and God forming ancient Israel, forming this ancient people, giving a law so that this people is formed in contradistinction to the oppression of Egypt. So it's a community no longer uh, where those pharaohs among us accumulate resources at the expense of others, but it's forming a community where every person can flourish, especially the most vulnerable. If you put it another way, there's to be no pharaohs, would-be pharaohs in the community that God's creating and shaping by the law. And of course, I'm just showing you the Ten Commandments. I, I could spend a whole subject with you at Regent College on unfolding other aspects of the Torah. Maybe I will one day. Let's go to the Eighth Commandment, thou shalt not steal. This command, thou shalt not steal, was given to restrain the rich. And that might sound kind of uh, unlikely to you. And it seemed unlikely to me uh, when I first started to think about the Torah as a scholar. Because when I read Thou Shalt Not Steal as a child or even as a young adult, even when I was, say, at university in undergrad, my mind, my, I must admit, my imagination went to Hamburglar from McDonald's. Is Hamburglar certainly in Australia? Is Hamburglar a Canadian McDonald's thing also? An American McDonald's thing, perhaps? A Hamburglar is this thief in a black mask with black and white stripes on his shirt, just the exemplar thief. And of course, Hamburglar, probably a poor little thief, creeping into rich people's houses, stealing their jewels, right? And that's what comes to your mind. And you think of thou shalt not steal, and that's what comes to your mind. Uh, poor little people with black masks and Hamburglar tops should not be going into rich people's houses and stealing their diamond necklaces. And and, you know, it is true enough that this command does restrain that kind of activity on behalf of the poor. Sure. Though I will say St. Thomas Aquinas wrote 600 years ago that if a thief is a poor person is hungry and steals in order to eat, they're taking what is rightly theirs. And so the Christian tradition, when it comes to the theft of a, on behalf of a poor person, uh, certainly makes room in light of this biblical principle that the good gifts of God must be shared. From the rest of the Old Testament, particularly the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, what we call a Pentateuch, we know that the focus of thou shalt not steal, the primary intent is different from restraining the activities of Hamburglar. The, this command thou shalt not steal is, is, is given in the context of emancipation from Egypt. It's given so that there aren't pharaohs among this ancient people of God. Let me explain. There's many lenses I could take right now to get into this and try to unfold this for you. But let's go to land law in the Old Testament, how land was to work out. Land law, laws surrounding land was the main protection against poverty in ancient Israel, God's ancient people. Every Israelite family was to own land, suitable for agriculture and grazing. I mean, I don't know if you remember from the biblical story, but the the land was divided up among Israelite families so that every family had a means of production. And this land ownership, according to the Old Testament, could not be revoked by anyone. Let me quote one ancient law, Leviticus 25, 23. Leviticus 25, 23, the land must not be sold permanently because the land is mine. So here's a principle in the Old Testament. The land must not be sold permanently because the land is mine. God owns the land, and God has given everybody some of it. God owns the land, and God has given everybody some of it. What a remarkable economic arrangement. How life-giving. Wealth-producing capital is in the hands of every ancient Israelite, not in the hands of a privileged few. You know, this means that no one ancient Israelite family can permanently fall into poverty. And no one family can accumulate excessively. The accumulation of Pharaoh is prohibited, right? So two sides of the coin, you know, one side, side A, the command you shall not steal, among other things, 
It secures God's gift of land to each family. And the other side of that coin is, you shall not steal restrains excessive accumulation on the part of one person or one household at the extent at the expense of the others, right? You could summarize the spirit of the eighth commandment with the words of a New Testament scholar, Craig Blomberg, who wrote, God owns it all and wants everybody to enjoy some of it. God owns it all and God wants everybody to be able to enjoy some of it. So I think this is just fantastic, you know. As a human being and also as a Christ follower, I reckon let's, let's celebrate the fact that God has given enough for us not only to live, but enough to share. What a beautiful worldview to live into. What a beautiful story to live into. What a beautiful challenge to society, but a joyful challenge. And what a beautiful invitation for those of us who are Christ followers, but all of us, to live as a con contrastive community. To live in a different way that shows the rest of the world what being human in society is all about. And I get excited when I speak to Christian young people, young leaders, whether or not they, they want to stay in their vocations, if they want to be pastors, I don't mind. I just get excited when I see young Christians dreaming together about how to be an intentional community, about how to live together in community in a way that's different in their neighborhood, showing the rest of the world to live starting with their life before they talk, start using their mouth, what, God, what, what a beautiful vision, what, what, what God's desire is for humanity in this world. And I believe in this very much post-Christian culture here in Canada that that's what it means to witness to Christ, to embody very much what we see in Jesus, you know, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I mean, just to do that arc of the biblical story for a minute, you know, Jesus is the son of God, but he sort of didn't invent that stuff. We know, say, from Matthew 5 to 7, that Jesus was being what God had called ancient Israel to be. Jesus as the king of Israel was fulfilling what Israel had called to be. In the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 to 7, we see Jesus, who's embodying this tenderness, this tenderness in the biblical story, and gathering a people, what we call the church, to embody this tenderness in Jesus' name. Well, I look forward to watching some of you guys and seeing you uh, live into this stuff and embody this stuff very locally, in very small ways, not big, just small, authentic, faithful, grassrootsy ways. We have more commandments to go. Let's do a couple real quick. The ninth commandment, thou shalt not bear false witness. The ninth commandment says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And any lawyers on this call or any lawyers on this call right now, you know, any lawyers will know this about the law courts, right? This is about, this is law of judicial procedure. It's about the law courts and ancient law. In fact, the Old Testament's full of law of judicial procedure. In practical terms, in ancient Israel, as disputes adjudge the city gates, powerful people may not bribe witnesses or sweeten judges, depriving the vulnerable of their land or their family or their life, enslaving them. They may not do that because of the Ninth Commandment and the other laws of judicial procedure there in the Old Testament. This commandment, in the context of the first five books of the Bible, what we call the Pentateuch, it focuses its gaze not only on individuals, but also on legal systems, insisting that legal systems have integrity and compassion. It insists on legal arrangements where people who are vulnerable have a voice. You know, the most vulnerable people in any society are also vulnerable at the level of legal systems. Always. You think in the U.S. of private prisons that are profit-driven and cost-cutting. You think it displaced people globally and the difficulty even of getting a fair hearing in most countries. Canada's pretty good. But the recent, just this week, Trudeau government challenge of uh, the uh, third country agreement with the U.S., um, a judge said the third country agreement uh, disadvantages refugees because they could be in danger to be sent back to the U.S. And of course, they could be in danger to be sent back to the U.S. because of Trump's policy of detention. And the Trudeau government just stupidly challenged that. Why challenge 
keeping refugees safe? Why challenge keeping the most vulnerable in the world safe? And so uh, refugees can't make, if they walk across the US border in Canada, according to Trudeau's law, which the judge challenged, they can't make a refugee claim. But according to international law, they should be able to, they can. Anyway, I, you don't have to understand what I just said there in 30 seconds, or perhaps I, I shouldn't because there's complexities there. But my point is that thou shalt not bear false witness. This divine call to just legal systems is relevant for humanity throughout the ages. And it's relevant for, the, relevant for people who call themselves Christ followers, right? A little, little alone, one could speak about uh, judicial justice along racial lines. You know, I was reading Drew Hart's book recently, and I read that one in three black males born in 2001 in America, born in 2001 in America, can expect to spend time in prison at some point during their lifetime. This compares to one in 17 white males. It's ridiculous. Let's go to the 10th commandment. Thou shalt not covet. So let's look at the look at the Ten Commandments and observe the change of heart that God desires from God's people in the Tenth Commandment. Have a look at this. You should not covet your neighbor's house. You should not covet your neighbor's wife or your neighbor's servant or female servant or ox or donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. And just in case you're looking for these texts, once again, the Ten Commandments are there in Exodus 5 and Deuteronomy 20. You should not covet. This command calls God's ancient people to something higher than just rules. It calls them out of an attitude of acquisition, the attitude of Pharaoh, to a spirit of mutual care. You know, I remember seeing a, uh, a blog by a pastor, and he wasn't a, a very bright pastor, if I can say. And in this blog, he called the, the Pentateuch and these laws in the Pentateuch that we're looking at today, the boring stuff in the Bible. And and he just described these rules as fairly rigid. Well, you can see that the spirit of these laws, in fact, uh, is to transform the heart. That we don't desire something in a way that would detract from our neighbor's well-being. In fact, in our heart, we desire their well-being. Love your neighbor as yourself, as, as it says in Leviticus 25 and, and Leviticus 19. And so the 10th commandment calls us to a spirit of mutual care a desire that every person can thrive. So let me try and just sum up. In the, Old, in the Old Testament, the first five books are called the Pentateuch, Genesis to Deuteronomy. And Genesis to Deuteronomy tells the story of the creation of the world, and that's very important because what we learn there is God really cares about this world. Genesis 1 and 2, God created a good world with care and delight. And the narrative of the Old Testament, God calls a people, God's ancient people, ancient Israel, to live in such a way to show the rest of humanity what being truly human is all about. In the face of all the muck and the filth and the mess in the world, God called one people, loving all people, that's super clear, say Genesis 9, Genesis 10, Genesis 8, they called one people, to live as a contrastive community, an intentional community. And the most amazing thing to me is that God chose an enslaved people group and thought, I'm going to start with these guys. Pulls them out of Egypt and gives them these laws that shapes this community to be a community where every person can flourish, especially the weakest. A community that's in contradistinction to the oppression of Egypt. And here's a beautiful thing. It's a shift of kings. No longer is Pharaoh king and the Egyptian gods, because you know what Pharaonic rule looks like. It's awful if you're one of the Hebrews. It means the death of your son. But now, take commandments for as much as saying, now God is at last becoming king. And this is what it looks like. It looks beautiful. And you've got a role to play. And your role is to live into my desire for humanity. That's what the Ten Commandments are doing. And as the, the biblical story unfolds, the story of the Hebrew Bible unfolds, Israel doesn't live into this reality. They're not faithful to this law, to this good word, to this God. But then in Jesus, 
Jesus is a king in David's line, an unlikely king. Doesn't look like a king, but he's, def- he's descended of the Israelite kings, and he is being everything that Israel was called to be and gathers a people by the power of the Spirit and the power of his resurrection to live as a sign and an instrument of this beautiful rule of God. He calls us to follow. Let me finish just by this beautiful quote by Henri Nouwen, which to me summarizes something of the spirit of the Ten Commandments. The most honored part of the body and not the head of the hands which lead, lead and control. The most honored part of the body aren't the head of the hands which lead or control. The most important parts are the least presentable parts. That's the mystery of the church. As a people called out of oppression to freedom, we must recognize that it is the weakest among us, the elderly, the small children, the handicapped, the mentally ill, the hungry and the sick, who form the real center. Paul says, the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, it is the parts of the body which we consider least dignified that we surround with the greatest dignity. 1 Corinthians 12. Now it says the church is a people of God can truly embody the living Christ among us only when the poor remain its most treasured part. Care for the poor, therefore, is much more than Christian charity. It's the essence of being the body of Christ. It's really, be- really beautiful. It doesn't say everything the Ten Commandments is saying. I'll just leave it there for one second in case you want to screenshot it. Let me just return to the two questions which I started with. The first question is, what is the difference between the way in which the Ten Commandments are understood in your church, if you're a churchgoer, and their original intention? And then this second question, you guys are training for a whole variety of vocations. How can we nourish one another, UCM, to pursue God's desire for human community in your vocation? And I want to add an extra question. I just wonder how the Spirit of Christ is opening up your imagination right now for how God might want you to be a part of nourishing or birthing or transforming a worshiping community, a church, an intentional community that can deeply and very locally in a particular place by loving a neighborhood to life embody God's beautiful desire and beautiful tender heart for the world that we see here in the Ten Commandments. Right, Diane, I can really go on. I'm definitely done done that's we're up to 10 there's no more commandments if i pretended there was an 11th everyone would know i was making it up thank you so much mark that was very incredible um yeah at this point um We bow our hearts, we bend our knees O Spirit, come make us humble We turn our eyes from evil things O Lord, we cast down our idols So give us clean hands Give us pure hearts Let us not lift our souls to another Give us clean hands Give us pure hearts Let us not lift our souls to another Oh God, let us be a generation that sees, seeks your face, O oh God of Jacob. O oh God, let us be a generation that sees, seeks 
your face, oh God of Jacob. We bow our hearts, we bend our knees, oh Spirit, come make us humble. Our eyes from evil things. Oh Lord, we cast down our idols to so give us clean hands and give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another and give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts Let us not lift our souls to another Oh God, let us be a generation that sees And seeks your face, oh God of Jacob Oh God, let us be a generation that sees your face, oh God of Jacob, to give us clean hands and give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another, and give us clean hands and give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another Oh God, let us be a generation that seeks Seeks your face, oh God of Jacob Oh God, let us be a generation that seeks Seeks your face, oh God of Jacob. Seeks your face, oh God of Jacob. Seeks your face, oh God of Jacob.